So this is a story about the Egyptian revolution and how we had a chance to have democracy for one year. What Everybody year thinks, was this Sorry? What year, baby? What year? 2011. Okay. So everybody thinks of Egypt this way. And uh, yet it looks nice. <laughs> you know, the pyramids, the Sphinx, some Greek and uh, Roman architecture, the sand, the scorching hot sun. And uh, it is, this is Egypt, but uh, Egypt is also a place where this happened. This is um, our first day of the revolution. Um, I was 17 years old and I found an event on Facebook that says we want to go out in the streets and uh, ask for democracy. So we did, and we were shy of a thousand, very small amount. That's uh, around 2 p.m. that day, January 25th, 25th, 2011. And what happened is, we became five millions in half an hour. Yeah, somebody just started saying, a shop you read the squat in the zone. And this means the people want to bring down the regime. People were sick and tired. And uh, the dictator has been in power for forever. This is a whole story that you can read about it. But this this term became our our language. Everything we say was just these four words, and it, it meant everything. So we marched from Giza to Cairo, and to do that, we actually had to go through this bridge. This is the first bridge ever built in Egypt, 300 years ago. Even the lights are still lit with uh, oil and fire. So um, we had to go over this bridge and, and this is when things got really ugly. You can see on the, on the left, on the right of the bridge, that's us. That was somewhere sm smack in the middle in there. And on the, on the left side, you would see the police with full force. They started raining us with tear gas. Uh, and it expired tear gas, which is pretty bad. Um, and then they started bringing the water cannons. It was January, extremely cold. This water can cannon would actually lift you off your feet, uh, maybe break your ribs, something like that. So um, for us, 40 or 50 degrees, that's pretty cold. Uh, maybe to here, here in America, it's not very cold, but for us, we would freeze. So. That's, that's the weather there at the time. Um, you can zoom in a little bit and see what exactly happened. Uh, I remember this like the back of my hand and, and uh, how people persisted that this is good and we need to keep going. We've never had any interaction with the police like that. Even if we did, it was hidden. It was not in the media. Nobody hears about it except the families of the people who were killed. They would mass shoot everybody and just finish the whole thing undercover, no pictures, nothing. And that's where citizen journalism comes in action. We had a lot of people with cameras who were just taking pictures, uploading them, before they cut the internet and the phone and, and the electricity and everything. We had a chance to tell the world this is happening. And we had support from everywhere. It was, it was amazing. So, after this, things settled down for 18 days. For 18 days, we sat out there in the square in what's considered like Times Square of America, similar to that. It was the center of Cairo. It was where the government is concentrated. We stayed there and we sat on the floor, no food, no shelter. Some people made makeshift tents. My tent was on the far left, down, down on the far left in the picture. Um, we just sat there. We just decided that, you know what, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna sit here and we're gonna wait out until the dictator decides to leave. Every two days he would come and talk, I am the father of Egypt, I am your father. Stuff like that, you know, like, like every other African dictator. What was his name? Mubarak. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Tahrir Square. Is this is Tahrir Square, which uh, ironically means the square of freedom. 
that was a happy coincidence. Mm -hmm. And this place holds a great place in my heart. Um, now it's, it's become bastardized because of the current dictator. But back then it was a beautiful place, even with the mess and the, the smell and all of that. It was a place that still has a place in my heart. Um, from then, things settled down. The dictator decided to leave the power and the military took over the country. We were happy. We were happy that the Egyptian military is now in control. This is a good thing. We love our military, we respect the military. This is a good thing. It was not. Because people like me, we realized from the third week after the revolution is finished, that the revolution hasn't finished. The military is taking over the power, they rewriting the constitution, adding all these amendments that give them ultimate power, pretty much. Uh, they are not planning on any democratic elections any soon, so we took to the streets again, but now with less numbers. In those couple of weeks, people were tired in Egypt. Everybody had to stand to defend themselves after the police disappeared. Just The police just disappeared with the president. And that's when the military showed their ugly face. They started surrounding us, they started killing people mercilessly. Um, I was held in this red building in the back, the Egyptian Museum, the Great Egyptian Museum. I was held in there, it was a makeshift military detention. They tortured us, they, they did horrifying things to people. And that's where we realized again that there is no going back. We've moved forward and we're just gonna keep moving forward. At this time, this is now, we're, we're about six months from the revolution in 2011. The state is, there is no police at all. The police took their clothes off and disappeared. Uh, the, all the prisons were opened, all the criminals are out. The dictator is hiding somewhere with the military and the military is managing the whole thing from the background. They let us suffer for a year to learn that we should not revolt again. That's what the military did. Um, we even had people writing graffiti on the military tanks. We love the military, the revolution succeeded, all of that. I was not one of these people, um, but everybody disappeared. Uh, like everybody in Egypt decided that the revolution is done. Everything is done. Let's go, let's go home. Um, without asking what next, and that's the question we failed to answer actually. What next? If you're gonna revolt, you should know what you're gonna do after revolting. Unfortunately, we didn't have an answer to that question at the time, and the military played us very well. Um, after I came out from the, um, the Great Museum, the Egyptian Museum, I was held there by the military. I was tortured, um, I was gonna disappear, but I was one of the lucky ones. A uh, few people died, in there and then a few people were taken to I don't know where and I was one of the lucky ones who could escape from the military and uh, I took again to the streets and from then we spent a whole year I'm sorry if this is triggering anybody I, I don't mean to trigger anybody but these are just basic facts and, and I tried to get the least um, the least painful pictures I could find um, we've lived in this apocalyptic vibe for about a year under the military rule. Again, no police, no president, no government. Uh, just the military managing everything from the back and arresting everybody. Anybody who talks against the military. Now our chant shifted from Yaskot, yeah, uh, down with the regime, to Yaskot, Yaskot, Hukm al Askot, down with the military rule. And these words are just four words, but they're so powerful. They're so engraved inside of me and, and people like me. We chanted, we didn't stop. It was, it looked like an apocalypse. It, we, would, we would stand in front of the military and they would now shoot us with live bullets all the time. They, they wouldn't care anymore. Uh, but we wanted this election. We wanted elections to happen. So we, pers we persevered, pretty much. We tried to have the last laugh with the military. The military was bleeding us out, spreading the case in the country, in 
in a controlled fashion. So when people give up, the military comes to the rescue. But we, and when I say we, I say people between 17 and 30. They call us the youth of the revolution in Egypt. The rest of people in Egypt just wanted to move on with their lives. A lot of people even give up on the revolution after the third month of instability and they wanted to go back to the dictator. Um, and it was very harmful to see it in the eyes of people in Egypt. After all this sacrifice, after they showed you their, their bad face, you want them back. But it happened. You see this red, red thing on her finger? That's called freedom, that's democracy, that's elections. We had elections, and this elections was the greatest achievement in Egyptian history. To me, it's bigger than the pyramids, bigger than anything. For 10,000 years, since the dawn of civilization, this is the moment when we had real choice in Egypt. So everybody was very proud of this. I, I never washed my finger when I did it. <clears throat> and we, we got this guy, Dr. Mohammed Morsi, a uh, materials engineering scientist from Cairo University. We elected him as president with 53% of the votes. Very different from the other elections we had in Egypt where the dictator wins with 99.9% .9 all the time. My friend here is smiling, so you're familiar with that. So uh, this guy won. He stood in the square, he opened his jacket and said, I'm not wearing a bulletproof vest. I'm from these people. He was brave. He wanted to um, change Egypt to the better. He wanted us to make our own, our own guns, our own medicine, our own food, instead of just living off other countries. He started in this process, but when there is ignorance and there is bias, mistakes happen. And we are very infested with ignorance and bias in Egypt. Everybody in their own bubble, in their own religion, their own biases that are so archaic that don't fit in the 21st century anymore. And he was also one of those. So I call him the... I don't want to say bad words, but he was not very wise, unfortunately. He gave in to his biases, and when that happened, the military found another chance to take over our democracy again, and they did. They made a coup d'etat after one year of democracy, and they put him in the orange suit, they bombed his house, they killed his family, and uh, he was very brave, and he stayed there until they executed him eventually. And this when, when things took an ugly turn. We had a civil war, a semi-civil war in Egypt. We had two factions in Egypt that hate each other. One of them supports the military, and one of them against the military. But the issue is, the faction that supports the military in Egypt now is like 70% of the people. We call it the party of the couch, because they are always sitting on their couches. <laughs> they supported the revolution when it was cool, and then when it's not, <laughs> they went back to the military. And then the, the other 30% left, we were like 10 different factions hating each other. Between communists, socialists, seculars, capitalists, Islamists, Coptics, we all hated each other. We all wanted a piece of the, of the cake. And we all turned on each other and made alliances with the military to do that. So our divide was our fall. I'm not saying we're all bad people, but we're all good people. This is not a, a love story that ends with a happy ending. This is just a story of facts that I'm telling right now. When we did that to each other, um, this is what happened. The military came with their tank and they killed all of us, pretty much. They, in, in, in half an hour, they killed 5,000 people of all types because we, don't, we dared to go on another demonstration and it was named the worst massacre in the 21st century. Mass massacre. It's called Rabah. You can, you can find it on Google. 
the military was funded by the Arabs, and that's why I hate the Arab, uh, the Arab Spring term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a spring, but the Arabs sabotaged it. Um, they funded the dictator to take over Egypt. And at this point, everybody was silent. This was more violent than the revolution. Whoever died in the revolution, that's... Nobody went to the prison in the revolution, but 2,000 people fully died, or were killed, murdered. But now, 5,000 were murdered in half an hour. In two months, it, that number was up to 15,000. We had 26,000 students from Cairo University and all the universities in military detention still today. Things became really bad. Everybody in Egypt was silent. I have friends now who work for the military. They don't want to speak up. They were against the military, they still are, but th that's what feeds them and their kids. But the students of Cairo University were not silent. We owned that university. We, we spoke when, when, when speaking was illegal, not just not allowed. If you speak, you get shot. That was, that was the situation in Egypt. And we didn't just speak, we shouted. Those were, were good days. We, we said our opinion, we said what we wanted, again, to the military, and again, we showed, we showed the dictator how weak he is, how unrecognizable he, he looks like, that in a country where nobody can even breathe, we were demonstrating, we were making songs, we were chanting, we were in control of Cairo University. Little background on Cairo University, it's a very old university, built about 200 years ago. It's a bunch of castles that turned into places of science. And at, at Big Ben, we were under a British occupation at the time, and they built this to simulate the Big Ben. So, this became the picture of Cairo University. They shot us with live bullets, with tear gas, day after day after day. We didn't stop. We would march, and we would chant against them. We would show them that we're, we're still here. You cannot have a legitimate state, because you're not legitimate. The dictator, the military leader. They, they hurt us pretty bad. This was our logo, students against school. This movement were also, was also quashed eventually. And, and all these students, you see, we were between one of three. One who was arrested and still in prison, now 10 years later. One who was killed and one who was able to escape. Leave. Um, but I haven't left, left Egypt fully. It's my home, it's mine and I claim what's mine. Did not give up on it. You can see here on the far left of the picture, that's me during the revolution. That's me against the military. And I traveled the world when I left Egypt. 
I went all over the world. I went to so many countries, I learned a lot of cultures, and I realized Egypt is where I belong. That's my home. And I should not give up on it. I should not hate it. Um, so I went back. <laughs> Doesn't matter how I went back. I have a death sentence in Egypt. But I was able to get in for a little bit of time. I climbed the Great Pyramid of Giza. I took a picture with a chair that once belonged to my great-grandpa, King uh, Echnatur. So, to me, these, these are small acts, but they are symbolic that this is my country and I will always be there. Um, they cannot own it. The, the military, the dictators, they think they are made of um, something different from humans. They cannot take this from me. It's my heritage, and maybe it's a small act to climb the pyramid, but to me, it means that that's mine, and I will, I will not leave it behind. So if, if you come out with anything from today, it's that first you should know what to do next after you try to do something good, that this world is not very pure. Not everybody will support doing good unless it succeeds. Now Egypt in a horrible state, inflation is more than 30%, that uh, 300%, so people are 300 times poorer. Uh, people like me, youth like me, are in prison till today. They built all these prison complex in 20, between 2014 and 2015 that cost billions of dollars around Cairo. Um, there is 26,000 people my age still in prison for 10 years now. Military detention, not prison. I remember the Prime Minister of Uganda when he was here and talked with me. He said that you are in military detention, not prison, correct? And that was, that was fascinating to me that he realized that it's not a prison. We didn't do anything wrong. So, and the last thing I want to say is uh, be happy and don't give up. <laughs> it's this is the, the purpose of this is not to show you something gory or something sad. It's just this is what happened, and this is my story. You can make your own story out of it. Thank you very much for listening. So, Tensor, Tensor, yes. Thank you so much. You know, I, you. I I watched how you show that you know you, you three of you got together and said we're tired of this. You know, you're tired. And so then you concocted a plan and you put it in place. But had you never done that, you'd still be where you are. Yeah. You know, if, if black people, African people, we came from Africa, same place you're talking about, had we never tried to revolutionize, and we did revolutions and we were killed yes. in mass because we were, as you say, they tried to teach you, don't ever do this again. Yeah. So we were taught many, many times, but we didn't stop. We had to continue to do that, and it's sad to say that when you're not being treated fairly, when there is no democracy, this is what happens. You have to stand up for yourself. You it's have to stand up and not give up. Exactly, and you and you have to realize I might die. You yeah. know, with Martin Luther King, the same thing. Yeah. Banding people, I watched how you all were holding together, how you had locked arms. That was so that that meant so much. It resonated to me because Martin Luther King locked arms with people to walk across the Paddy's Bridge against the police, and you said to police, yeah, the military, yeah, not your friends, right, overthrowing. And so everybody else gets protected but you. They are your friends when they are doing their job. If they're not doing their job, they are your enemy. But then they turn around and call it their job. Yeah. Their job is always to keep people from telling them that they're not doing their job and that they're not fair. That ends up being their job. So it didn't trigger anything, it just made me feel for what you were feeling. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing your story. Good. And uh, I have your information, I'll be in touch with you. I have to go present across the way. Thank, thank you for your comment. Yeah, it was very nice meeting you. Any questions? <laughs> You guys, don't worry, this is, this is history, just history. It's like a history class, so if you have any questions, any comments, please go ahead.
Um, hopefully, in the future, okay. we have to change my name or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just curiosity, where yeah. you got shot? Where Sorry? You, where you body? Uh, yeah, so uh, first day of the revolution, I got shot in my leg here. Um, the bullet came in here and came out of here. And uh, when about four months later, under the military, I was shot in my shoulder right here. Yeah. And the last time was during this uh, university demonstration. I was shot in my head with a, uh, a bomb. Uh, I guess that I don't call it a shot. No, it's about that. <laughs> yeah. It was a tear gas bomb, yeah, and, and normally they shoot it up and it falls, but this time he shot it in my head. And it was actually in that video, one of, uh, one of my friends created this Molotov and shot it at that officer. That's the officer that shot me. Hey, welcome guys, you, you missed it. <laughs> well, enjoy the food. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.